Hi, welcome to Midwest Magic Cleaning. My name is and we just spent four days cleaning out a pretty hoarded basement. Now, rather than just show you still shots, which is what I normally do, I'm gonna do a walkthrough of this whole basement because at first it just looks like a super cluttered basement, like one that a lot of people have, where you just throw in your extra crap and then forget that it exists. However, I wanted you to see the size of the basement because this thing is absolutely massive. And though it doesn't look like anything crazy as we're doing a walkthrough, once we start start unpacking all this stuff and once we start moving things around it's going to blow your mind how much stuff is actually in here. This house is owned by a woman who somewhat recently went through a divorce and there was kind of an ugly legal battle for her to get her house back. The house was built in 1988 and it's been her thing for that whole time. Over the course of the marriage and a few children the horde had built up over the years and once she got her house back she got a hold of me so I can come do my thing and unhoard this nightmare because it's it's kind of bad. I mean, you'll see other rooms next week, but I needed to start on the basement this week so that we can take stuff from upstairs and store it downstairs. But as you can see, as we walk through this, there's no real place to store any extra stuff. So this was the most logical place to get started. The interesting thing about this house for me is seeing that there are multiple hoarded objects from multiple people. This is one of those rare cases where that this isn't just one person who's causing this problem. From at least one son, and it appears the dad, there's a hoard of electronics, cables, deer hunting equipment, baseball cards, magazines, and a ton of just random objects. The two most hoarded objects in the house so far have been paperwork and clothing. Now we'll get to the clothing here in just a little bit because you'll see how much there was whenever we dive into that section. Anytime you see a green garbage bag, that's nothing but clothing going into it. This room that we're starting in, the hardest part of unhoarding it was getting rid of the paperwork. And we're actually not getting rid of anything. We're actually just putting all the paperwork into tubs so that it can be sorted through later. Right off the bat, and this is why you can't just shovel armloads of stuff directly into the trash, we found a deed to their land, which was 24 acres. And we found the title to a car, maybe 50 extra pictures that were just like family photos stuffed in with the paperwork paperwork, but overall 99% of everything we picked up was completely useless junk paperwork that has absolutely no value to anyone. We filled 19 large Rubbermaid tubs completely packed full of paperwork. Each one of those tubs completely full weighs around 60 pounds each. Now normally in my videos I usually tell you how to deal with an overwhelming mess in the most sanity saving way as possible, but in this one I'm having to use more advanced tactics, but we still break it down the same way. So step one is getting everything out of the room. But while I'm doing that, I'm sorting things as it passes through my hands. So for instance, I may open a box that has a bunch of random stuff in it. CD cases, craft supplies, baseball cards, magazines, and paperwork. Since there's so much of each of those items, I'm going to sort those items into their own specific piles. So I'll hand Jason a tub and say this is full of crafting supplies go put this in a crafting section in the middle of the basement then we'll start a box for all the random baseball cards that we find then we'll start another box and its whole purpose is just nothing but extra cables then once we get all that out of the room and sorted then we'll box those up consolidate those items and put them back into their proper storage places if i had my wish we would throw away 90 percent of everything in this basement however the owner is just now getting to where she can go through all this stuff after the divorce. And so I'm making it to where she can actually access the things that she wants to sort in a more reasonable and efficient manner. So I'm breaking down this basement into sections and we're going to designate spots for specific items. So one corner of the basement is going to be nothing but extra clothing. One part of the basement is going to be nothing but their Christmas decorations. That way at some point she can say, I want to sort through my craft 
crafting supplies and pare those down, she can actually just walk to the crafting section of her basement and there it all is. Now you might be looking at this place and saying, how can you possibly make this accessible if you're not going to be throwing away stuff? And there's two points to that. One, we did throw away a ton of stuff that was broken or obviously trash. I'll show you a picture of the amount of trash we took out of here at the end of the video. And two, everything was so spread out and random that once we started consolidating those into tubs and boxes, space naturally freed up. Also keep in mind that one of the other things they hoarded a lot of is cardboard boxes. By the end of this cleanup, we had taken out anywhere from 50 to 100 extra empty boxes. Most of them were broken or water damaged, and then they all went into a burn pile. Once again, keep in mind this is deep country. There are no recycling centers around us. So as you look around the basement and you're seeing lots and lots of area that's covered up by random stuff. Keep in mind that a large portion of that is just useless cardboard adding bulk to the hoard. Some interesting things that we found in this first room would be two PCs that were so old they actually had floppy drives, and we found about two boxes of old three and a half inch floppy disks. We also found an original Duck Hunt gun from the original Nintendo, as well as Super Mario Brothers and Duck Hunt, the original double cartridge. We also found a church pew and tax papers from 2003. Now, older people like me hear that number and think, well, that wasn't that long ago. No, it was 20 years ago. Those tax papers, if they were a human, would now be of legal age to drink. And if you didn't feel old until I said that, you're welcome. Now there's another thing I found in here that frustrates me every time I find it during a cleanup, and that is Scentsy products. On this channel so far, I have cleaned roughly about a hundred hoarder houses, and I would say that in probably 85 to 90 of those houses, I have found tons of Scentsy products. Now on the off chance that I end up losing losing my mind and deciding to do a partnership in the future, allow me to destroy that partnership before it ever happens by saying that Scentsy is a plague. Every time I find it in the house as someone with hoarding disorder, it's always bought in bulk. There are boxes upon boxes of scented wax and wax warmers and lights and stands. And every time I see it, to me, it's the equivalent of pulling out a few hundred dollars and just setting it on fire. For those of you who don't know what Scentsy is, it's a multi-level marketing company that sells scented wax and trinkets and blankets. And on their own, the products aren't bad. They're expensive but they're not bad. But what they want you to do is sell their products for them at basically like Tupperware type parties. Now, fortunately, that wasn't the case in this house. It just makes me mad when I see it because I see it so often. There was just one, maybe two boxes of Scentsy stuff in this basement. But what I'm used to seeing is people with dozens of boxes. It's typically people who think that they can buy this series of products, have these fun little parties where you get together and you demonstrate some of 
of them and you play games and then you sell them like Avon from the 1970s. And it would be just an easy, fun way to make money. That is almost never the case. What they end up with instead are dozens of boxes of useless crap that they paid way too much money to have. If you're buying Scentsy because you like their stuff, that's totally fine and I'm all for that. I like some of their stuff. If you're buying it because you want to start a career, you desperately need to look up the statistics, even if that research is just reading the Wikipedia page. Just go down to the business model section and then whenever you're done laughing, just shoot me a quick thanks in the comments. So you'll be happy to know that we actually are able to do donations in this cleanup, but it won't be us that will be doing them, it'll be her. She's aware of the clothing situation as well as the furniture situation because she's got some furniture that just doesn't need to be there anymore. She's part of a church that takes mass donations every March. So she has a trailer sitting outside and then whenever we get all this stuff sorted and she's sure that she has the things that she wants to donate separate from the things that she wants to keep, they're going to load up that trailer and then take all those things to the church. The things that the church can't use right off hands, they have like a big sale and that helps finance the church. We also put all of the old obsolete electronics into the bedroom. We live in an area that has an electronics recycling sort of a free for all two or three times a year. So for no charge you can just drive those things to the dump and they have a separate section just for old electronics. We put all those things in this bedroom together so that it would be easy to just send a couple of dudes down there as pack mules. They can just go down, grab the stuff, bring it up to a trailer, and then they can haul it off to the dump. That way, at least they don't have to search around the entire basement trying to find these things because, again, that's a huge basement. Then when we get into the main part of the basement, you'll see us section off one gigantic section just for old toys. And these are toys that the kids have long outgrown. So as far as I'm aware, those will also be packed up and donated. Now, not to be outdone, I'll be matching their donation by giving away one free spin kick to the neck of anyone who steps up to this fool or a 50% discount on one long look at this fine Midwest butt. These lovely lady lumps. Oh yeah. I'd like to give a couple shout outs real quick to some channels that uh, if you haven't heard of them before already I think you'd like them. The biggest of those would be Spencer from SB Mowing. He does what I do except with yards and I just finally met him via email and text this 
this last week. Super nice guy. He does a lot of great work and a lot of uh, uh, stuff for free for people who can't afford it. Another one is called Different, but the, instead of D-I-F, it's D-I-Y-F, Different. It's a couple who's fixing up a mobile home from scratch, and it's not just what they're doing, but their, their personalities are great. I love them to death. And the guy on that channel reminds me of an exact crossover between Post 10 and Harry Mac. But their videos are super chill, super relaxing. When I'm trying to wind down at the end of a day, I've been putting on their channel and just chilling out and watching them work. And one of the most fascinating, relaxing, most impressive channels I watch is called Epic Upcycling. The whole thing is done without narration. And it's a guy using basically just hand tools to turn everything from scrap wood to pallets into really impressive high-end furniture. And all the videos through like the first half to 75%, you're thinking, wow, that's pretty impressive. And then when you get to the end, you'll be like, holy crap. I didn't think humans could do that. But if I ever need to just calm my brain down and get on like a Zen type level, I can watch that channel for hours and be totally at peace. So suck it. And then obviously us. We're like just under halfway to a million subscribers right now. We're edging up on half a million. So if you haven't hit subscribe yet, that would go a long way toward me not spin kicking you in the neck because I'll do it. I'm not putting up with it. So a couple questions I'm sure you've got already. One would probably be, is this somebody's bedroom? And the answer is no. I'm sure somebody used to sleep down here a long time ago, but nobody has in many, many years. They just haven't taken the bed down. This room along with the rest of the basement just became a port of storage. Uh, why aren't we like cleaning in the traditional sense? We've been really lucky over the last couple houses and that we haven't really had to clean. The owners have made sure that the place is kept really clean. I mean, this basement it didn't even have cobwebs in it. There was a little bit of mouse poop. It's the amount of mouse poop you would expect any farmhouse in the Midwest to have. Remember, this is a house surrounded by many, many miles of field. So when they harvest corn or soybeans, all the mice that were in the field then come into the house looking for food. Then when it goes from fall to winter, they come into the house looking for shelter. Pretty much every house in the Midwest has mice. But like this didn't have anything that I would consider to be a biohazard or dangerous. It was just like normal Midwest stuff. I mean, the only danger that was in this basement was the one that appeared the second I stepped down into it, son. Every room that I enter becomes a dangerous room. I know you're probably thinking, what are we doing with all the stuff? We're literally just bringing it out into the, into the main part of the basement. We're putting all the stuff into piles of similar objects. So if, for instance, we found a bunch of decorative shelving or picture frames, we're going to put all those into one pile, then crafting supplies and another other and so on and so forth. I talked about it earlier. Then once we have the room cleaned out, then we're going to bring each of those things back in because as we're bringing them out, we're putting them into their own tubs and their own boxes so that they can be consolidated into one area. That way, whenever we bring them back into the room and we start stacking them, we can stack them way more uniformly. And the amount of space that that saves by doing that sort of categorization is pretty significant. I mean, you'll again see the, the before and after picture at the end of the video, but it's pretty significant. It's kind of funny once we start getting so deep into this pile. Like for instance, when we get to the closet, I can tell that at one point, one of the kids must have had his room down here and his room got super messy and he was told you have to clean this up. And then he just took giant handfuls of everything that was on the floor and threw them into a giant box and then crammed that box into the closet. You can see it whenever I'm going through the box. It was just handfuls of random CD 
cases and old toys and baseball cards and old letters. So one of my jobs is, as annoying as it is, is to pull out that box and go through it, find out what's truly junk and get rid of it, broken items, anything that may have mold on it, literal garbage like wadded up paper, and then separate out the things that are still good and find out what consolidation tub is appropriate for that to go into. And when you're sorting things like this, you don't necessarily even have to have tubs represent a type of thing. So it doesn't have to just be, here's the tub that's full of books. It could be more general. So it could be, here's the tub that has all of your son's old crap in it. So the category is son's crap. And that's a perfectly legitimate way to sort things. And we did in fact have several tubs that were exactly that. But overall, we tried to sort those out into more specific things because they have so much stuff. And it's always nice to be able to, so, well, for instance, I found a box that had a couple thousand baseball cards in it, just all thrown together. I don't want to throw random junk into a box with a bunch of baseball cards because the baseball cards themselves could have value. So I'm just going to save that box and all the other baseball cards that I find will go into that. I want to keep those totally separate from everything else. But when we're sorting out old toys, those are just going into a tub that's just the general concept of toys. I don't care if there's board games or stuffed animals thrown in with it. It's just all toys to me. Now, one big mistake that I see people making who live in these conditions is that when they decide to clean up the house, they'll go overboard with cleaning supplies and especially with tubs. They'll go out and buy 20 or 30 gigantic see-through tubs, thinking that it's going to help them with storage, and they're correct, but what they're overlooking is, as you go through each of these boxes and as you free up more space, the old tubs that you have will become more and more available. So I almost made that same mistake when I started on this house, I almost went to Dollar General and just bought all their see-through tubs. Fortunately, the car I drive is small and can't hold a whole bunch of those, so I put it off. Then the more Jason and I cleaned and consolidated, the more those tubs that she already owned made themselves available. By the time we were done, we ended up probably filling 50 plus tubs with stuff that she already had and ended up with one tub left over that didn't have anything in it. Since the goal goal is to consolidate and discard, it means the stuff that was sitting out on the floor is no longer taking up space within the room, but is now taking up space within tubs. Now you have to be smart about how you do it and how you pack things, but in most cases if you're packing correctly, by the time you're done you'll realize that you didn't have to spend any money at all. And it's the same thing with cleaning supplies, brooms, mops, chemicals. You can use the stuff that you already have in your house, but make sure that you use utilize the really old crappy stuff to clean rooms that aren't in the public eye. So we basically just used an old shabby garage broom to sweep up the basement when we were done. 
But for the average person who doesn't do this all the time like we do, when they decide to jump into a gigantic cleaning, they go to the store and they just overkill it on the items that they buy thinking that those are going to help them or make it easier or make it faster when all they're really doing is spending unnecessary money in most cases, then having an overload of cleaning supplies and now they have to find room for whatever's left over. So they're actually adding to the hoard by doing that. In every single instance, let's say I've done 150 hoarder houses on the channel. In every single instance, I've always found trash bags in the house, just under piles of garbage, just thrown out among like their kitchen cabinets or on the floor of the basement. And this one was no exception. We found, I think, three, maybe four boxes of trash bags down here. The point being, though, don't go out and spend a ton of money in preparation. Just start the cleanup. And if you happen to need anything, you're going to know that within the first day. Then go to the store. You got into this situation because you have too much stuff. Some of that stuff is going to be cleanup stuff. I feel like I just spit a rat bar there, albeit a bad one, but I mean, it still felt like a bar. When you're doing a project like this and you need motivation, the best way that I've found to do that is to give yourself a finish line that's easy to cross. So what I do is I look around a room and I pick out two or three things that annoy me. In this room, it would have been, I think there were two mattresses, a small one and a large one. And I know that if I move those into the other room, not only would that make better storage, but it opens up your field of vision so dramatically that it makes the room feel bigger just by removing moving them from the clutter. So I give myself two easy finish lines to cross. Move this mattress, then get to this mattress and move it. The whole thing takes a couple minutes at best. And once I cross that finish line, I'll look at this area in a whole new light because it's not being taken up by this giant monolith of a mattress. If what you're doing makes you step back and think or say, holy crap, that made a difference, then that's what I shoot for. What's the easiest thing to do that makes you say, holy crap? After that, it's just finding the next annoying thing or breaking down the room into a grid and saying my next goal is just to clean this corner. My goal after that is to clean this corner because I'm telling you this room right here had so much stuff it felt impossible. But I know from experience that just by doing a couple of key things, you can trick your brain into thinking that you've made more progress than you actually have. And with cleaning, that's kind of the goal, tricking your own brain into thinking that this doesn't suck suck. I mean, obviously, there's people who don't think it sucks, like myself, Ari Katarina, Clean with Barbie, a beautiful mess. We do this because we love it, but admittedly, all of us are really weird. I think for most people, cleaning sucks, but your brain doesn't have to know that.
So we're doing this room the same exact way that we did the smaller bedroom. We're moving things out and at the same time we're creating piles of like-minded stuff. But the advantage we have when we started this room is that the original room that we cleaned is now empty enough to put stuff back. And that stuff now exists in this area. So as we're naturally putting stuff back into the bedroom, it's naturally clearing up the room that we're currently in. So it becomes an assembly line of this goes back in the bedroom, let's put it here so it looks symmetrical and orderly and this is brand new stuff over here that we haven't sorted yet so let's start making new piles of like stuff and just continue the process here's where all the clothes go here's where all the paperwork goes here's where all the toys go you're just sorting jigsaw puzzle pieces that's it that part to me is really fun because you can start to see the things that they collect that they haven't gone overboard with so for instance, she likes wicker baskets, but she doesn't have so many that it becomes a problem. For wicker basket fans, yes, there were some longer burgers in there, and yes, we did keep them all. The only baskets that got thrown away were ones that were crushed and ones that didn't have a name brand, but they had to meet both of those criteria in order to be thrown away. So anyway, we, we made a basket pile. Then they had a pretty good collection of Christmas decorations, but it wasn't ridiculous, so we made a whole section just for Christmas decoration. We're not worried about putting them away, we're worried about just grouping them together so that they can be easily put away later, which you'll see us doing in this video, but we're just not worried about it right this second. Going back to the jigsaw puzzle analogy, you're not looking to put the blue pieces together, you're just gathering up all the blue pieces so they're easier to find. Now in the process of doing that, we know that all the clothes are going to be going into green bags, and we know they already have a large section of clothing behind the couch. That made it way easier for us because that man we could just put the clothes into bags and just fling them over in that direction and then worry about stacking them properly whenever we get to that section. That really helps us clear out the section we're working on currently way, way faster because we don't have to stop and think about anything. Our whole process is just clothes, bag, rrr, and it's the same thing with the toys. Any toy that we find, there's already an open box full of them in the corner. So we just chuck the toy over into the corner and we'll worry about making them look pretty and then introduce new boxes and new tubs to that as we go.
Frequent breaks are a key to cleaning up something that's this cluttered. We were taking breaks like once every 20 minutes and there's no specific amount of time that we take on our breaks. We just kind of sit down, catch our breath, make dumb dad jokes at each other. Then just whenever we feel like we sat long enough, then we get back up and go to work again. The thing about breaking it down into 20 minute sections is that that's not quite long enough to get completely exhausted. So before our bodies reach that point, stopping and taking a break kind of interrupts that exhaustion flow. Now that's not to say we weren't exhausted because we were. We were really sore after all this because remember we did this for four days but it kind of keeps the monster at bay for a little bit. It also helps your sanity. If you're doing this for many hours on end it's going to be extremely easy to get frustrated and angry and start blaming people for the mess. That's just human nature when your mind gets too frazzled and it gets too stressed out and it gets too overstimulated people tend to lash out mentally. By taking breaks every 15 or 20 minutes, we're kind of heading our brain off at the pass and not allowing ourselves to get frustrated. It basically boils down to whenever you get tired, both physically and mentally, you get cranky. And then whenever you take frequent breaks, it doesn't feel like as much of a job. It feels more like just something you're hanging out and doing. And that's the way I always want it to feel when Jason and I are working together. We're just two dudes hanging out and we just happen to be cleaning. Another thing that I make sure I do consistently is every 20 minutes, every 30 minutes, just every so often I'm stopping, looking around the room and saying in this general area that I'm working right now, what's annoying me? What's something I can take care of right now that's going to make me feel better about the way the room looks? So it may be there's a dresser that's been sitting here the whole time and we can just easily move that to the other room. It could be a pile of toys that's been sitting on the ground instead of in the toy box and I've just been kind of stepping over it the whole time, maybe just stopping and picking that up. And now there's a clear floor that makes me feel better about walking through there. Any extra little dopamine hit that I can give myself extends my enthusiasm and my motivation for getting this done. There were many times where both Jason and I stepped back while we're taking our break and looked around the room and said, holy crap, that looks crazy. As in better. As in the difference in what we're looking at right now versus the condition that it was in is just mind boggling. And that in turn makes us kind of ramp ourselves up into jumping back in and making the rest of the room look the way we just made this section look. Another thing that you'll want to make sure that you do is occasionally look around and pick out some logistics to get rid of. Is there a shelf that's been in your way for the last two hours? Making sure you get it out of the way so you don't bump into it. In our case, we had had a pile of stuff in front of the bedroom door and it was making us have to kind of walk weirdly around it, kind of awkwardly around the pile every time we had to put something in the bedroom. So we finally stopped and took care of that one big pile by the bedroom door. And that logistical problem that we solved also became a dopamine hit because it looked so much better and it solved one of our problems. And we've all been there. You're painting a room and you've moved a, I don't know, a dresser out away from the wall so that you could paint the wall and you keep bumping into it or you keep having to walk around it. And then finally you're like, will somebody please move this stupid dresser before I set it on on fire. Well, we're just tackling those things before we get to that level of frustration.
Now, one thing that I get in pretty much every video that I do in situations that are this bad are people who say, I have just thrown every bit of that in the trash. And one, no, you wouldn't have. Two, you probably wouldn't have been in here at all. And three, I think that's the way people like to imagine how they'd react to a situation that they're just imagining in their brain. Like a person who hears a story from a friend who had a bad day at work, and then the friend's response is, well, I would have just quit. I'd have told him to lick my butt, and then I'd have quit right in his face. And it's like, no, you wouldn't have. You, you would have been mad, and then you would have complained about it to your friends the way your friend is doing to you. That's the way you've imagined it in your head where you're the main character. Well, in a situation like this, we're not the main characters. The owner is. She's wanting to take steps to improve her living conditions. She was brave enough to ask us for help, even though most people would be super embarrassed about this. And then she's banking on the fact that she can trust us enough that we're not just going to toss all of her crap into a fire without her permission or knowledge, that we're not going to violate the trust that she put into us. Whether or not she actually sorts through this on her own when we're done, whether or not she donates stuff, whether or not she gets rid of stuff is of no concern to us. She asked us for help to get this into a livable condition, and that's exactly what we're doing. No, not all of this is her fault. Some of the fault lies with um, her kids, with her ex-husband, with friends and whatnot. Some of this is her fault, and she's aware of that. But she's taken steps in the right direction, and we're going to honor that by doing what she asked us to do. We're treating her like a human because she's human. When you add in hoarding disorder, even if hers is mild, you always have to keep in mind that this is a neuropsychological disorder that's triggered by trauma. There's a physical problem in the brain that causes a psychological response. People with hoarding disorder attach emotion onto objects because you can kind of think of it like a cross wire where emotional regulation and large decision making aren't functioning properly. And so those two physical problems in the brain attach emotion to objects and a fight or flight response if those objects are removed outside of their control. The other way to say that would be if you were to throw those objects away, it's on par with throwing one of their pets away. And in severe cases, it would be like throwing one of their children away. This isn't a choice that they're making. It's a nightmare that they have to learn to manage.
keep in mind, there's a lot of this stuff that is out of her control that she's just now getting a, a handle on. Like her daughter got married and moved out of state and left a whole bunch of stuff there. Her sons have some old stuff that they've never picked up. There's some furniture that she's wanting to pass to them and they just haven't picked it up yet. Her husband had a major problem. I think he's the main culprit with the paperwork. So all she can do is have us do our thing and then control what she can control. Personally, just having talked to her and having seen the condition of the house, my suggestion to her would be to get the boxes under control and get the clothing under control. Now she is, which is one of the brightest spots of any of these cleanings that I've ever done. She's taking active control over it. I just want her to be aware when she's controlling that stuff. To keep it in mind that as she's getting rid of things and she's donating or selling or whatever she's going to do with them, that she's saying to herself, I'm taking my house back. This is my house. It's not a place that exists for stuff. This house exists to house me. I say what comes in and out of here and I'm taking it all back. Having that level of control over your own environment is not only healthy, but it's powerful. The question I get asked above all others, at least in a general sense, is aren't you afraid it's just going to go back to this condition again after you leave? And my answer to that is always no. I don't care if it gets back in that condition again. If I can provide them with even two weeks of a clear house, clear mind, then that's completely worth it to me. We are one step in a problem that takes a lifetime of steps to get through. So like the way I see it is metaphorically, I've provided her with a pair of shoes to get her through through the next 20 miles of that journey. But that's only a fraction of the 10,000 miles that she needs to walk. By the time she needs her next pair of shoes, she'll be 100 miles away from me and I'll be providing another pair of shoes for another person on another journey. I, I know it's a dumb metaphor. I'm a shoe guy. It's all I could think of in the moment. So you can just shut up. Shut your face, Garrett. Garrett.
Now, there are some things we didn't reorganize. One was a large series of boxes in one corner back where all the clothes were. Basically, what we did there was anything, any box that we found that didn't have clothing came out and that stuff got put elsewhere. Any of the clothes boxes that were destroyed or broken down, we took the clothes out and put those into bags and got rid of the crappy box. We wanted to, to replace the boxes that were broken with boxes that were sturdy and could withstand the weight. So our whole goal there was just to restack things so they wouldn't cave in and make a close a lanch. There's also three or four shelving units in this basement that were already stacked up with a bunch of stuff. We didn't take any of that stuff off and we didn't sort through it. We can still do that, but that's going to take another full day. And right now we're worried about the bigger picture. At some point, if we have the time to do it, we can go back down into this basement, pull all that stuff off, wipe the shelves down, and then reorganize the things that are originally were on those shelving units and then reorganize the things that were originally on those shelving units so that it's more orderly and symmetrical and just looks a lot cleaner. For right now, we just looked around at all those things and said, okay, that's that's good enough. That's fine. I'm more worried about the things caving in than I am the stuff that's setting perfectly fine on shelves. They also have a few pieces of furniture that need to be taken out of the basement and are going to be taken out of there and brought upstairs so they can be hauled off. To be quite honest, my my bank is too sore to carry those things and so is Jason's. So they're going to get some younger guys who are beefier than us who contain more beef than Jason or I contain and then those guys can worry about that. But the way the basement ended up is going to make it a whole lot easier for them to do those things because now they don't have to worry about tripping over anything. They've got a straight shot from A to B. All they have to worry about is just lifting and carrying. Uh, this next part is for people who follow the channel closely. Uh, my wife Emily had a parathyroid removal. She has a condition called MEN1, which kind of spawns random tumors throughout your body. Uh, they oftentimes land on the parathyroid, which causes high calcium, which can be deadly. Another place is on the pituitary gland. She got the parathyroid removed. She's healing nicely. She's back up on her feet. She's getting energy. She's gotten to be uh, up on her feet and doing chores just fine. She's gotten her energy back. The next surgery is to remove another tumor from her pituitary gland. And that will be in mid-March. We'll hear the first of the information about that. So this will be the second time she's had one removed. So she's been through the process before. In mid-March, after we find out the information, then they'll kind of schedule things out from there. And we won't know when that surgery will be. Sometimes they're able to do it right away. Sometimes it takes four or five months before they can get anybody in. But I'll keep you guys updated, especially those of you who are members and see all the members only posts and things like that. And of course, always on the Discord because I'm usually in there hanging out being goofy. At the very least, I'm reading things that people wrote while I should be doing other things. People have also asked if we're giving up on the cleaning aspect of the channel. And I'll, I've said this in several videos, but no, we're going to be doing just as much cleaning as we always have. It just so happened that the last couple houses that we've done haven't needed it. So one whole video series that lasted close to a month was just repairing and painting somebody's house who was in kind of a desperate situation, but it didn't need like traditional cleaned. This one that we're doing right now is not grimy or cruddy. It's a clean house as well. It's just dramatically cluttered. But yes, as soon as we get a house that has, you know, is covered in filth and needs like that crazy type cleaning, we will absolutely do it. I've also spoken to Barbie and we're considering flying her down to my town. For those who don't know who that is, that's Barbie from a channel called Clean with Barbie. And she's awesome and she does some nightmare cleanups. But anyway, I was considering flying her her down to my town, having her stay for like a week, and then we'll go out and find some crazy place to clean. And she's asked specifically if I can find one that is as bad as the ones that she does on her channel. And that shouldn't be too hard to find. I don't know when that'll happen, but it's probably going to happen. I think that's all going to kind of revolve around Emily's surgery because we don't want to add any more stress than is already going to be present during that period. Okay, sorry for me getting way off topic there, but I mean, this is a long video. I've got a lot to talk about. Out, so you'll have to pardon me if I get a bit rambly. But back to this house, what more do we have to do with it? So they have a dining room that's super cluttered right now, and her bedroom is really, really bad. One of the upsides to this is it kind of kicked off a spark of a whole bunch of cleaning activity all over the house that wasn't us. And so her mom came over, and her mom has been itching to clean her kitchen forever, and her mom called dibs on the kitchen. We didn't film that. She doesn't want to be on camera, and that's totally cool. 
but she did spend about two days, I think, in the kitchen, just pulling everything out, going through expiration dates, wiping things down, getting rid of old food. And it was a pretty big job. I went up there a couple times and that, that kitchen was just covered in canned goods. So unfortunately, you won't see us doing the kitchen, but her bedroom is worthwhile. We're going to be going back there on Monday to do the bedroom and the dining room. And really, there's not a lot to do outside of that. Everything else is just minor cleaning, like just straightening out the living room, vacuuming, wiping things down. But you will see at least one more video from this house. And I think the bedroom could be its own standalone video because it is just absolutely annihilated with clothing everywhere. And by that, I mean an overload of clothing. She's got a whole bunch of it in the closet that she hasn't worn in ages. And everything that she does wear is pretty much stacked up in a giant pile at the foot of the bed. So I want to be able to take all the stuff out of the closet, bring it down in more green bags downstairs and then that way we can hang up the clothes that she does wear so she can actually utilize that closet for what it's meant for. Storage and function. And I guess that's really what we're doing with this with everything that we clean that's super cluttered is restoring function to a place that has lost its purpose. And if there's a secret that I've got to how I do things or how I maintain things, it's that if your room has a purpose, a defined purpose, and you stick to that purpose, it's way easier to maintain the room because then you look and find a whole bunch of stuff that doesn't belong with that purpose. So for instance, your bedroom, if its only purpose is to sleep and then you find a bunch of crafting stuff in your bedroom, then the crafting stuff is out of place because it's not helping you sleep. The crafting stuff should go into a room whose purpose is crafting. If the living room is where you watch TV while also crafting, it can have a dual purpose like that, but you don't want to keep stacking purposes on a room. You don't want like an everything room. You don't want your living room to be where you watch TV, eat, sleep, do crafts, do arts, work. It creates chaos in the brain. It creates tension. Then all the stuff that's utilized in all of those activities tends to build up all in one room and then it just becomes absolute chaos. Chaos. If you have a crafting room and it's got nothing but craft supplies in there, you instantly know what's out of place because it's something that's not craftable. Like you find a giant moose walking around in there and you're like, I don't craft moose at all. That moose does not belong here. That belongs in the moose room. Get out of here, you stupid moose. I'm sorry. I'll go to the moose room. <laughs> For those who don't know, we have a members only section. We have three tiers. We have a bottom tier, which is just for people who want to throw a little extra support for the channel that gets you access to discord if you so desire we have a middle tier which gets you that as well as an extra video every week usually on a wednesday but sometimes i post it on tuesdays and then we have a top tier for crazy people as i always mention in these videos if you can't afford that any of the tiers please do not become a member we're doing fine financially this is just for people who want to show like direct monetary support for what we do the videos that we post each each week for the member section are typically pretty laid back. We're a pretty loose crowd. And last I checked, there were like 1,200 of us, I think. But the people who are members are all super supportive. They're really cool people. I have one of the best communities on YouTube and I work really hard to keep toxic people out of it. But if you're interested in that, we have a link to that in the description of the video or a link to that also in the bio of the channel. But the number one thing you can do to support us is just clicking subscribe. Once we reach a million subscribers, we get a gold YouTube plaque and there's not really anything I've ever asked of my audience on a personal scale, but that's the one thing I want. I want the gold plaque and at the rate the channel's growing, we may see that by this summer. Anyway, thanks for watching. Members, I will see you this Wednesday. Everybody else, I'll see you next weekend. Later.